In this, uh, these past few weeks since Easter, we've been in a series called You Asked For It. Are we familiar with the concept of You Asked For It? We had y'all fill out a survey Easter weekend, and we wanted to know what you wanted to hear. And then some of our amazing administrators. Can we give a hand to the administrators in the house? They may not hold a microphone very often, but they're making this thing go. I am so thankful for administrators. You know, uh, so they compiled the results from that, and then we saw which of the topics were most requested, and we're doing our best to preach on the topics that, mo- that had the most requests from what you asked for. Now, one of the things that y'all like to hear about every year, we get this column that I'm always looking at, I'm like... Here we go. Revelation and end times. So we're going to go there a little bit today. But I need help from the Lord. (laughs) Because I'm going to be real with you. This this, this is not what I wake up every morning getting excited to preach about. But I will say this. I do believe that that, that God is faithful to drop a word in our hearts as we are faithful to pursue him. And I have pursued him. I have pursued him. I've labored over this, and I believe that God has a word for us this morning. So would you join me in prayer that God would meet us today and that he would speak? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is so much more than a book. We thank you that it is living and active, dividing even between soul and spirit. Lord, we thank you that our hearts are laid wide open when your word is spoken. And we we do pray that our hearts will be softened in this place this morning ready to receive your word. I pray that for myself. Oh, Lord, that you would show us your heart today. Show us your heart and that we would be forever transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it's not a surprise to me that the book of Revelation and end times are closely associated in people's minds. Even the very title of the book is a translation of the word apocalypse. And as soon as I say apocalypse, some of you are probably thinking like Bruce Willis, explosions. There's, there is an asteroid headed for Earth. I mean, that's kind of what I think. However, as we read Revelation today, I, will, I, I do want to let you know that end times prophecy is not going to be my primary focus. But I do want, I, I have an explanation. Don't throw any stones at me yet. It's not going to be my primary focus And I'm going to tell you why. You see, apocalypse or apocalyptic literature, while it does focus on eschatology, eschatology is a fancy word for the study of the end of things, and more specifically, the study of the end of the age as we know it. It is just as much concerned with revealing a transcendent reality or truth. Now, the book of Revelation does address the end of reality as we know it, or as a certain group of people knew it, depending on your interpretive method. All of my eschatology nerds out there are going, oh, yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm here for you. But I would submit to you that its primary purpose is not to direct our focus toward the timing or the little events of that end. Many believers study the book of Revelation in hopes that they will discover how the events of their day, you're probably familiar with this, how the events of their day are represented in this book as to help them know what period we are in or how close we are to the end. (laughs) I remember when we had a certain president a few years ago, and I'll say this, the word antichrist is not actually even in the book of Revelation. Moving on. (laughs) Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that eschatology is unimportant, okay? My, es- my eschatology buddies, I, I, it's not that I don't like discussing it, okay? I was just discussing it this morning with someone. The Bible addresses the end of life as we know it, or as the original recipients knew it in many places. There is a place for Christ- in Christianity for this field of study. I believe that. There are many valuable things to learn. And before you take away from this message and you go home and, and you have in your heart, well, Seth just doesn't care about eschatology. Don't do that. Instead, write this on your heart. What we believe about the end of our current reality does have an impact on the way that we live, and that is deeply important. Did you write all of that on your heart? So you're not going to write me off as an eschatology hater? Oh, yeah, sure. 
What part? <laughs> I'm just kidding. What we believe about the end of our current reality does have an impact on the way that we live, and that's deeply important. Now, what I am trying to say is this, that when we look to Revelation with an attempt to see how close we are to the end of this age by comparing biblical language to the events which we are experiencing in our lives, and then we give so much attention to these things that they just might become a distraction from, I'm going to use this word and I'm confident about it, weightier matters like evangelism, spiritual formation, and caring for those in need, I think that we might unintentionally miss the heart of God. Now, because you asked for it, I am going to touch on it a little bit. We're just probably not going to go as deep as, as some of my friends here would like us to go. I'm looking at you, Logan, but I'm just playing because I, I know we're good. Now, the, prime, the four primary interpretive methods for the book of Revelation. Uh-oh. We're going to go over them. We're not going to go super in detail, but I am going to summarize them for you because I do want to at least whet your appetite for you to go and to look into this more. Because there are certain assumptions that people make, but there are actually four main interpretive methods for reading the book of Revelation. They are, and I should have had this on the screen, historicist, futurist, preterist, and idealist. And I just lost probably a quarter of the room. Please stay with me. We, we are going somewhere, and I promise it's worth it. Now, the historicist view associates the prophecies in Revelation with actual historical events and identifies the, the book's symbolic beings with historical people or societies. For example, one of the primary one, uh, historicist viewpoints would be looking at Revelation through the lens of the Roman Empire. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the futurist view assigns all or most of the prophecies in the book of Revelation to the future. Who would have thunk it? The futurist view thinks that Revelation is talking about the future. Shortly before the second coming of Christ. Now, this is a popular view, very, very popular view, that you're probably fairly familiar with. And it comes in several variations, depending on where you believe we are on the timeline of Christ's return and what you believe about the nation of Israel. And I'm not going any further. Now, the preterist view holds that the contents of Revelation are a prophecy of events that were fulfilled in the first century. Now, not the very first century, but the first century A.D. You feel me there? And uh, the, with the primary event kind of surrounding this idea of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Have you guys heard of that before? The destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Okay. So the preterist view focuses a lot on, the, on that area. Now the idealist view, the fourth view, sees the prophetic imagery in Revelation as symbolic, but it views it as symbolic in the sense that um, the, the idealist view would look at it as Revelation dealing with the nature of the deeper spiritual reality of the world behind the scenes throughout time and not tied to one specific event or time period. Another way of describing that or another, another uh, name for the idealist um, viewpoint is an allegorical viewpoint or one way I've heard it described is the, theo the theopoetic viewpoint. Ooh, that's a fancy word. <laughs> Now, the big question that you've all been waiting for. <laughs> what am I going to talk about? <laughs> Which method is the correct way to interpret Revelation? I don't know. And really, as confidently as people talk about this topic, I don't think that they really know either. I would say that I believe that each method has its strengths and weaknesses, and I think some of them are stronger than others. And that is just as much of my opinion as you are going to get. Now, we have people email us sometimes asking about what our official stances on the end times and interpreting Revelation. And sometimes I feel like this email is a tryout for whether they're coming to heart of the city. <clears throat> Can I, I'm going to try to roll, roll my eyes harder. So I'll give you our official stance. This is what we quote to them. We believe that Jesus is eventually coming back. And that our job until then is to fulfill the Great Commission. Yeah. 
I know some of you mad. I'm just, I'm, that's a quote from our elders, y'all. So you can take that and you can decide whether you can coexist with us or not. You may not like that answer, and that's okay. Seriously, I love you. You are so welcome to have a more specific stance on this topic than we do. You're welcome to it. I love you. But the church has been so divided on this issue and even willing to break fellowship with one another over it. And I can say confidently to you today, that is ridiculous. I ain't going to church with you because I think the end times are going to be different than you. Please, come on, man. Now, there are absolutely essential beliefs within Christianity. I'm not saying it's all loosey-goosey, believe whatever you want at all. Don't hear that from me today whatsoever. There are core foundational truths to what it means to follow Jesus. They are very real, and they are very, very important. And more than ever, we must stand upon those truths. But this end times interpretation thing, it ain't one of them. Oh, 909. <laughs> I'll just remind you that I love you. And I know you love me too. I'm, I'm telling that to myself right now. I'm prophesying over myself. 909, 909 loves me. Mm. I receive your love, 909. Now, all that being said, my responsibility in this moment is to teach the scriptures. And we are way further into this message than I'm comfortable with without the scriptures being read. So we're about to hop to it right now. So the remainder of our time today, we're going to be focusing on what I would consider the latter part of the introduction to the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3. Now in chapter 1, John, the author of the book, tells us about a vision that he receives of Jesus and a command from Jesus to write to the seven churches in Asia. Now because of limited time, our focus is going to be on two of those seven churches. If I tried to, to break apart all seven messages to all seven churches today, we would have a sermon series not a sermon. So we're going to go with two, and I still might go over time. Help me, Lord. Now, we're going to look at how these, the words in these two messages of correction and affirmation and instruction can actually be very applicable to us today. And we're going to begin with the first church, and that is the church in Ephesus in chapter 2, verse 2. I know your works. Actually, we're going to stand for the reading of the word because we're going to be old school about it. I love standing for the reading of the word. You know what it tells me? This is the most important part. And it is. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. Don't worry, we're going to address this part because it can feel kind of random in the moment, but we're going to address it. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the other message we're going to look at is the, is the message to the last church mentioned, and that is the church of Laodicea. 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 We're going to go with that. Chapter 3, verse 15. I know your works. Ooh, this is right out of the gate. The other, one, the other one, it was like, you're enduring. Good job. And then he brings the heat. Jesus comes straight out of the gate with the heat. Pun intended. You are neither cold nor hot. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. <laughs> Tell me what you really think, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love when people have it in their mindset that, that Jesus was this like hippie Jesus who never said anything hard. I just want to laugh and laugh and laugh. Jesus was always gentle. <laughs> oh, 
no, he wasn't always gentle. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. We're going to receive that as a word of comfort today, Lord. (laughs) Takes a little break. Just so you know, I do love you. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. And he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. What a beautiful, beautiful promise to the one who conquers. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and you may be seated. Hey, can we give a hand clap for the word of God? I'm so thankful for the key of keys. I'm so thankful for the tethering point of my life. I'm so thankful for a truth that I can stand on in the midst of the storms of all kinds of weird beliefs and opinions and feelings. You know what doesn't change? The word of God. You know what doesn't pass away? The word of God. And if I am silly up here, at least the scriptures were read. So you got some truth in your spirit today. Receive the word of God. I exhort you. Receive the word of God. Now, what is Jesus saying to the churches? Let's start with Ephesus. You know, he starts with some affirmation. I like that. You know, we like to practice kind of like a compliment sandwich here. Whenever we're bringing correction to people, we like, we want to bring encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. Can you work on this one thing? And then encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. Now, I wouldn't quite call the letters to the churches in Revelation the compliment sandwich, but, you know, I appreciate the affirmation in the beginning here. Thank you, Jesus. He affirms them for their endurance and their intolerance of false teaching. Can I get an amen? Amen. And then affirms their endurance again in the very next sentence. Jesus likes their endurance, it would appear. He really affirms it strongly. But then he comes with a rebuke. Here it comes. Sliding it in. He says, I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. He challenges them to remember where they came from to repent and to do, go back to the works that they did at first. And if they refuse to do so, the repercussions are grave. Hey, y'all, do you know if you're saved, you still need to repent from sin? <laughs> We've got about half the room saying amen. So they're like, I don't know. I don't know. No. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know what Jesus' grand introduction to preaching was? Repent, for the kingdom of God has come close to you. We're going to move on. Now, this part about the Nicolaitans, I told you I would tell you about it because without context, it's like, okay, who in the world are the Nicolaitans? Now, the Bible doesn't talk a ton about the works of the Nicolaitans. But what we do have is early church leaders who wrote about this sect, who was a sect marked by compromise in which they mixed in different beliefs and practices from Judaism and occult paganism into Christianity. And what it led to was a watered-down false version of the faith. That's what we know about the Nicolaitans. Keep that in your mind. Now, we're going to look at the rest of the message to the church in Ephesus in one moment, or in a few moments, depending on how long this takes. But right now, I want to move over to the church of Laodicea. Jesus comes right out of the gate with rebuke for this church. He calls them lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, which is very likely a reference to the placement of the city of Laodicea between two water sources, one hot and one cold. How many of you know that there are, there are uses for cold water? There are uses for hot water. There are uses for lukewarm water, I suppose, in a sense. I mean, like, I guess I like to sit in lukewarm water. Like, you know, like a, no? Like a pool, a heated pool, no? Is that kind of gross too? I don't know. <laughs> but have you ever been to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina and sat in the lukewarm water of the Atlantic Ocean? Anyway, that's not the point. The point is that it's not for drinking and that Jesus will spit it out. That's the point. (laughs) I just wanted to be fair to lukewarm water for a minute. (laughs) Just give it a stay in court. The lukewarmness of Laodicea appears to be associated, hear this, with the way that they had begun to trust in worldly wealth and luxury, not realizing their own spiritual poverty before God. I I got everything I need. And God's like, 
except the main thing. He then, he then says, he reproves and disciplines those whom he loves, which Laodicea can just put that in their heart and say, thank you, Lord, thank you for that brief word of encouragement. Both of these appear to be associated with their lukewarm state. Trusting in riches, no zeal, no repentance. Think about it. Jesus also seems to be saying that the church in Laodicea had not welcomed him into their midst. What did he say? He stands at the door, knocking, ready to fellowship with them if they will welcome him in. Now, I want to turn right now to draw your attention to the end parts of both of these two messages to these two churches, which actually contains common language found in all of the messages to the seven churches. I think it's probably important. Wouldn't you say, if Jesus decided to say it about seven times? Okay. Near the end of each church message, we see an interesting phrase. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this seems to be a reaffirmation, I would say, of two things. Of authority and of universality. What do I mean by that? These words are coming from God himself. And they are more than just for the church, that particular local church at hand. And that we as the church of today ignore them at our own risk. Behold what the Spirit says to the church has. Now also near the end of the message, we read that a particular type of person, a particular type of person will receive what appears to be an eschatological Remember when we talked about that word, study of the ends of things or the ends of the age? An eschatological or an eternal reward. To Ephesus, both of them are beautiful promises, actually throughout all of them. Beautiful, beautiful promises throughout the seven messages. Jesus says this person will get to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. How many of you want to do that? (laughs) Some of you don't want to do that. Okay. (laughs) Don't worry, there's an altar call at the end. I'm sorry. I do love you, 909. (laughs) To Laodicea, he says this person will get to sit with him on his throne. What a beautiful promise. But what type of person is that? The one who conquers. What an interesting, interesting word to use. See, the word conquer from Revelation 2 and 3 is the Greek word nikao which means to conquer, prevail, overcome, or be victorious. It's related to Nike, or we might say in America, Nike. (laughs) Listen to how Nikao is used in 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Now, in this passage, it's interpreted or it's, it's translated as overcome rather than conquer. I'll let you know that. It's important to know. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's good news. These two verses lead us to believe that the one who conquers or the one who overcomes is at least is synonymous or at least very close to synonymous with the one who has been born again, believing in Jesus as the Son of God. That being said, I still find it very interesting that Jesus chose to use this word to describe faithful believers rather than simply saying those who believe or those who follow or disciples or those who obey. I wonder if Jesus is trying to give us a picture of what belief looks like. I wonder if he's trying to show us That belief is more than just intellectual assent to a set of truths. More than just acknowledgement that something happened. That maybe belief, rather than just a raise of a hand, looks more like this. Logan, will you stand here for a minute? Uh Uh-oh, this is new. I did not do this, so I hope this goes well. Logan. There's a car coming towards you. Okay, this is the point where Logan might say, 
I believe you. Oh, thank you. Then you want to move out of the way. Okay, Logan has showed genuine belief. Sometimes I think that the way that we are defining belief as a church is we go, there's a car coming from you. And the person says, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. Car gets closer. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. Car gets closer. I believe you. No, you don't. No, you don't. Belief produces fruit. Action. Fruit. I believe responds to the belief that you claim to believe. Let's move on. What can we learn from Jesus, from what Jesus said to the churches in Ephesus and Laodicea? How can we be those who overcome? Now, I recognize this is not going to be an exhaustive list. You don't need to email me about the other ways that we overcome. You can email me in general. I'd love to talk with you. But I, I recognize that maybe the first thing that comes to your mind is how do we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony? Absolutely, 100% beautiful. But I also believe in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 that Jesus has given us some principles to live by in order to be those who overcome. We're going to pull these straight from these scriptures in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation. To be those who overcome, first, we must endure in the faith. Endurance. Oh, isn't that just a nice, shiny, lovely word that we all love? Have you grown weary in your faith? Are there areas where you're cutting corners or growing slack in your faith in Jesus? Are there areas where you're just about to give up? Maybe for you, it's a prayer that you've brought before the Lord over and over and over again, and it just never seems to come to fruition. Or maybe for you, it's a sin struggle or a wrestle where you've asked God to be delivered from it over and over and over again, and you've fought it, and you've given all your efforts into it, and you just feel like you keep struggling with it. I believe that the word of the Lord to you today as an overcomer is don't you dare give up, friend. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare stop contending. Don't you dare stop pressing into him. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Don't you give up. The mark of an overcomer, the way that is described here, is we are those who endure. Sometimes the answer to prayer is, I'm taking you through something because I am forming you. Sometimes that's the answer. And do you know what it takes to go through something and be formed? It takes endurance. To those who overcome, to be those who overcome, we must have love as our primary motivation. You see, remember this. Jesus affirmed Ephesus for their endurance, but then he said, I have this against you. You have lost the love that you had at first. Can I ask you, friend, have you lost the love? Has your faith become empty tradition? Have the spiritual acts of your life become obligation? Are you doing them out of guilt? Are you doing them out of shame? Are you doing them out of fear? Or are they coming from an overflow of love? You see, Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on these two things, that we would love God with everything that we are and we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Do you know why love is the highest law, the scripture says? Because love does no wrong to the neighbor kind of a funny catch-22. Well, all you need is love. Yes, and do you know what love is? I wonder, I wonder if there's someone in the room today that needs to remember the love that welled up inside of them when Jesus first came to you and delivered you from your filth. Do you remember the love? Do you remember being like the woman with the alabaster jar? Just so thankful that Jesus wanted you. To be those who overcome, we must, be dedicate, we must dedicate ourselves to truth and reject temptations to compromise. Have worldly beliefs and practices seeped into your faith? Have you begun to mix faith in Jesus 
with other elements from this world. You know, in, in, in a lot of the world, there's this idea called syncretism. I don't know if you've heard of it. In the Spanish-speaking countries, obviously, they would say in Spanish, syncretismo. That, the reason why it's stuck in my head is because that's the first time I heard of it. The first time I heard of syncretism was in Spanish. And it's this idea where Christianity, or another belief system, but primarily Christianity, gets mixed in with occult practices, usually witchcraft. And I might, you might be hearing that today and go, I'm not mixing Christianity with witchcraft, Seth. Okay, good. But I wonder if we aren't practicing a syncretism of our own when we mix Christianity with the claims of our favorite news station. When we mix Christianity with the pressures of the world on us that pull on our heartstrings and make us feel bad for believing truth. What are you mixing with Christianity? Because Christianity, faith in Jesus mixed with anything else is not just another version of Christianity. It's a completely different thing that is in opposition to God. We must be dedicated to truth. And you say, Seth, what about love? Absolutely. Absolutely. We speak the truth in love. But if it ain't true, it ain't love. That's the thing. Love is not tolerance. Love is not just saying everything is okay. Love is not just going, uh-huh, you do you and I'll do me. Agape is to truly wish, intend, and act on the absolute good of another person. It is not warm, fuzzy feelings or not making someone feel uncomfortable. That's not love. That is a perversion that we have been taught is love. If it ain't true, it ain't love. To be those who overcome, we must be zealous for God. We must be zealous, 909. Now, ze zealous is, is to have great energy or enthusiasm toward a particular cause or objective. I just want to ask you, church, what does your heart burn for? What do you burn for? And I know that many people in this room, your first answer, and it's the right answer, would be Jesus, and I'm, and I'm thankful for that. But what does that look like? And you go, Seth, it's not about appearances. You're right. It's not about appearances. It's about the heart. But do you know what the heart does? It overflows. That, that's, I'm, all I'm doing is saying what the scriptures are, are saying. Yes, it's about the heart. Yes, the whole sermon on, uh, sermon on the Mount flips everything upside down and it says it's about the inner you. But do you know what happens when the inner you is really zealous for Jesus? The outer you becomes zealous for Jesus. <clears throat> about half claps in this gathering. The thing is, is we've been designed to worship. Let me tell you this. This is, not, this is not a command. This is a law like gravity is a law. If you were to jump off this roof, you would fall and it would hurt you badly. You are gonna worship. I'm not commanding. I'm letting you know about a reality. You are gonna worship. It is written into your very image as a human being. You are a worshiper. The question is not whether you are going to worship. It is who or what you are going to worship. And I'm telling you, if you aren't worshiping him, you are worshiping something. If you aren't zealous for him, you are zealous for something. It's just not, about, it's just not a part of my personality to be zealous, Seth. Zeal is not a personality trait. Zeal is written into your very code as a son or daughter of the Most High God. He has made you a zealous creature. Do you know how I know? Because he has imprinted his image onto you and he is a zealous God. Zeal for your house has consumed me. That's what it says of Jesus. A prophetic word from David into the New Testament Jesus. Zeal for your, we serve a zealous God and he has imprinted his zeal onto us. You are zealous. Don't tell me you're not. Who are you zealous for? To be those who overcome, we must be those who fellowship with Jesus and welcome him in our midst. Can you stand with me?